May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. I want you to understand, we are this sort of people who throw away our lives for small things. Profound passion towards everything. An absolute dispassion towards oneself. This is the nature of one who has seen the world beyond color, beyond taste, beyond perception of the senses. in uh, northern part of India, which uh, presently in the region of Gorakhpur, which is in Uttar Pradesh. In this region, there was a yogi who uh, committed to one aspect of Shiva, which was called Alak Niranjan. Alak means that which is not perceivable, that we cannot see, hear, smell, taste. Niranjan means that which is colorless. That which is colorless, you can anyway not see, hear, smell, taste. It is not perceivable and it's colorless. Alak Niranjana Khilkhile Gunjan He went from home to home because this was the nature of spiritual people and the culture and the civilization. So when a sannyasi or a mendicant came in front of the house, nobody said no. Whatever they could give, always it was given. And they never asked for anything more than what they need for that day's nourishment. They didn't take money, they took only food. So he was going from home to home, Alak Niranjan, Alak Niranjan. One day, he came and stood in front of a wealthy home and said, Alak Niranjan, the lady of the house doesn't want to come out by herself. She sent the maid in the house to give him some grain so that he can eat. But she stood behind the door and looked at him. He was a young sadhu with big bright eyes and she was drawn to him. Next day when he came and said, Alak Niranjan, she herself came to give the alms. 
and she looked at his eyes and she fell into them. Then she went inside the house and felt ashamed. She's a married woman and what am I doing? But his eyes occupied her completely. Next day when he came, with the arms she ran to the door. She looked at his eyes, she gave him the arms and said, I am completely taken by your eyes. I can fall into them and disappear, actually I have already. He said, Alak Niranjan, Alak Niranjan and left. Hey, alak Nirajana, Alak Nirajana, Kachina Kantavu Molagittu Hennina Kannige Habbava Habbisi Melachina Muruti Melagittu Shabatavu maraitu, kupatavu teraitu, karaitu kinkini chankara, karanava yalaitu, haranava selaitu, onkari suvasmara tankara. Nilada meluda. Mellane tiduta saridalu pranayada rangeri Nillele jokhi ninnaya kannali yantaha kanti ukuniyutide Nillele jokhi ninnaya kannali yantaha kanti ukuniyutide Pujada kanti vilasa ke ravi shashi nai dile mani yuti ve Next day he came again. He said, Alak Niranjan, she came to the door. So he had a plate and he said, yesterday you said, you love my eyes. Here I have brought them. He had plucked his eyeballs out. And placed it in her hands. And said, Alak Niranjan and walked away. He's willing to become blind so that her inner eyes open up. These are the yogis and mystics of the world. Alak nirajana, alak nirajana, marudina bandhanu ajogi. Kina bhagilu gakkane tereitu, mu tere sereitu marayal. Taaiye tegadu ko inno ta jogiyu Nire ke thaliya kotti da Thaliya taladhar thala thala holayu Kannu ga leradannu itti da Taaiye ninnaya dina ninnaya Kanni na bannane maadidde Karathiya goriya kattti da togani na Aakan kitti do tanvi hai Alak nirajana, alak nirajana Nadedanu nirvyathe aajogi Pogali na kanvali Yudali jnanada Olagan tarai si kurudagi Rai ninnaya Sina ninnaya Kanni na bannane Maadidde Karatiya koriya Kattti da togani na Aakan kitti do tundi hai Alak Nirajana, alak nirajana Still we feel that
that mind chattery which always bothers us and our thought always shifts back to past and future imaginations which will not be any of output how to get rid of it a whole lot of uh, thought about this thoughtlessness thoughtlessness no mind these kinds of terms have been propagated all over the place and these terms have been badly misunderstood and made into all kinds of things and people are striving how to stop my mind. It took millions of years of evolution to get a mind of this kind of capability, hmm? isn't it? Millions of years of tremendous amount of nat nature's work that today you have a mind of this kind of scope. And now you want to stop it. Why is it that you want to stop it? If your mind was constantly producing absolute pleasantness for you, would you think how to stop this mind? Would you? No. It's producing lot of unpleasantness. That's why you are thinking of how to stop the mind. This is the first thing, wherever you go in the world, this has gone so much into people's mind. If you tell them you meditate, they say, but Sadhguru, I, I'm not able to stop my mind. I said that will happen only after you stop your kidneys, liver, heart. You stop all these things, then the mind will also stop. Do you want it to stop? No. Then why do you want the mind to stop? Why do you have such a horrible prejudice against the mind? You don't mind if your heart is beating, you can meditate. You don't mind if your liver is working, you can meditate. Your kidneys are functioning, you can meditate. If your brain functions, you can't meditate, what is the problem? You seem to have something against intelligence, isn't it? This is the conspiracy of the stupid against human intelligence that to meditate means your brain must be frozen. No. You don't have to freeze your brain. We were looking at this yesterday itself. We will initiate you into Shambhavi. It's a simple process. There are many ways to do it. This is one simple way. But it's a powerful process. If you sit here, you will see your body is here, your mind is somewhere, who you are is somewhere else. Once there is a space between you and the mind, then what the mind is not doing, what the mind is doing is not even an issue. It is like you are stuck in the traffic jam, you know, you are struggling through the traffic. That's one experience. Suppose you are uh, either standing on Chamundi hill, or you're floating in a hot air balloon and look down at all the traffic, very peacefully, traffic. Hmm? <laughs> Why? It's a distance, isn't it? When you're in it, traffic is a different experience. From really high up there, sitting in a hot air balloon, you look down, you can't even hear the sounds. Looks wonderful traffic, isn't it? Yes or no? Because there's a distance. So once there's a distance between you and your mind's activity, mind is not a problem. Mind is a miracle, it is not a problem. And anyway, if thoughts are going continuously, if you are having a mental diarrhea, obviously you ate some bad food, isn't it? Yes. If you're having a physical diarrhea, you ate some bad food, isn't it? If you're having a mental di diarrhea, you are obviously consumed something wrong. What… what this wrong thing could be is, the moment you identify yourself with something that you are not, then you're finished. Your mind is a continuous runs. There is no other way. Do what you want, try as hard as you want, it is not going to stop. If you do not identify yourself with anything that you are not, 
you know how to be with everything, you know how to use everything but you're not identified with it, then you will see if you sit here, simply mind will be like this. If you want to use it, you can use it, otherwise it'll be like this. Right now your hands are like this, or you're holding it tied up because it'll go all over, is it? No. You can keep it like this. You can keep it like this, you can keep it like this. When you want to use it, you can use it. So it's a useful instrument. Suppose your hands become like this. You know some people have become like this? Yes or no? If it becomes like this, you will become ridiculous, isn't it? If it happens to your mind, also you're equally ridiculous. It is just that you are living in the comfort that nobody else can see it. But people can see it. They watch you closely enough, they can see it, isn't it? And whether they can see it or not, that's not the point. The point is, the most important faculty of your life is out of control. Doesn't matter whether they can see it or not, that's not the issue. The issue is, the most important faculty in your life is out of control, doing its own rubbish all the time, not doing what you want it to do. So, if you have to be freed from this ailment, you should stop eating bad food. Wrong food or bad food means you are identifying yourself with things that you are not. If you sit here, if you're not identified with this and with this, then you will see everything is just fine. Then your mind will do what you want it to do, otherwise it will simply hang there and that's how it should be. Mind should not be telling its own stories all the time. It should tell the story that you want it to tell, isn't it? Otherwise it's quite a nuisance. The secretions of the pineal in the yogic terminology is referred to as amruta because once it begins its secretion, everything about you becomes sweet and beautiful. It is not the sexuality which limits it, but it's the excessive identity with the physicality which limits it. If you make it too big, you will become perverted in your head. If you try to obliterate it, you will become even more perverted in your mind. A ninety-two-year-old man went to his doctor for a full medical checkup. The doctor checked him up and he said, Hey old boy, for your age you're doing great, everything is just fine with you. But the man asked, but doctor, what about my sex life? So the doctor asked, thinking about it or dreaming about it? The more you try not to think about something, the more you will think about it. This is the nature of the mind. So there are many reasons why one indulges in sex. For some it is just pleasure, for some it is a way of building this bond and companionship. Otherwise people feel they are going away from each other. They may be just fine. But a lot of people, it is psyched in their mind that if they're not sexually involved, they're actually moving away. Not true. You can be very close to somebody and need not be involved in any physical manner, isn't it? But societies are psyching, especially in this part of the world, people are hugely psyched. If there is no sexuality, you don't really have a relationship. In fact, the word relationship, it's only… it took me some time to understand that here, if you say a relationship, you are supposed to understand it's sex-based relationship. Nothing else is a relationship. If… if I… I can have a very strong relationship with you and not be concerned about your body, isn't it? I may not be drawn to your body in any way, but I can have a very powerful relationship with you. But all those possibilities are completely discounted. A relationship means you must be in some way physically involved, man, woman or man, man, woman, woman, whatever you like. Essentially it's body-based. 
what kind of body is individual choices, but essentially it is body-based. This has happened because somewhere our identification in the body has gone beyond normal levels of identity. It is excessive identification with the body. That is why body-based relationships have become the crux of the society. One who is too identified with your physical body naturally is sex-driven because that is the highest thing that he knows. There are ways we can make you find something which is far bigger than this. Once you taste something better, I don't have to tell you give this up or give that up, it'll anyway fall off, isn't it? There are ways to do certain sadhana which is more intense than sexuality, which is more ecstatic than sexuality. On one level, if you have a thing. In all dimensions of yoga, one way or the other are ultimately trying to activate the pineal. Because once it begins its secretion, everything about you becomes sweet and beautiful. It creates a whole inner pleasure, which makes all the outer pleasures look like kindergarten stuff. That's the reason yogis are just sitting with eyes closed, not because they're against pleasure, they're against small pleasures, that's all. So the Shambhavi, one thing that's happening is, it stimulates the pineal secretion in a big way, which leaves you drenched in a certain level of sweetness throughout the day. It just leaves you in a certain state of ec ecstasy and blissfulness because the pineal gland is active. This is one aspect of your physiology which is very close to your consciousness. The rest of the physiology is about survival, but pineal gland is one aspect of your physiology which is very, very close to transcending the physical. In the yogic traditions, this sweetness is referred to as amruta or the ambrosia or the elixir of life. One drop, if it comes into the system, suddenly the whole system just cools down, the whole system is lubricated, functions at ease, the desperation in the system is gone, the desperation in the mind is gone. So, ambrosia means I'm saying when there's not a single idiot on the streets of London who is willing to make such a deal, how come the source of creation is willing to make such a deal with you? <laughs> so what do you think of organized religion then? <laughs> I generally don't think about it. <laughs> it is not that it has no use. See, if there was no religion, a lot more people would have lost their mental balance. <coughs> it is a very inexpensive way of psychiatry. <laughs> no, I'm saying, see, I want you to understand the line between sanity and insanity is so thin. Don't think there are insane people and sane people. Every one of you are crossing the line here and there. Some people are not able to come back, that's all the difference is. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> well, aren't you saying with somebody, I'm mad at you? So you are not mad at anybody, you're just mad, that's all. <laughs> you are able to go mad for some time and come back, so you think you're normal. Somebody went there and could not come back, it became a terrible problem, all right? So, do not assume sanity is some kind of a established… sanity is some kind of an established status for you. No, today you may be perfect, tomorrow morning you may be gone, do you understand? It's very much possible. Like today you're healthy, tomorrow morning you may be talking about terminal Ill illness, it's possible for any of us. So the same thing is possible with mental illnesses also. It is not to be taken lightly, but I'm talking about not exercising different dimensions of intelligence in a human being. Making an education system which is all like a factory extruder, everybody has to come of the same shape and form. This is causing enormous distress in human societies.
Yes. Uh, it's really nice to be with you, Sadhguru. I wanted to know about Adiyogi, because I've learned and I studied some yoga for years, and I never heard about Adiyogi except from you. Oh, you thought Madonna invented yoga, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the word Adiyogi means the first yogi. We don't know the exact time, but it's somewhere over fifteen thousand years ago. That much we know because of certain… Uh, certain relics we have found and certain things that have been said, certain astronomical uh, phases that they have talked about. Based on this, we estimate it's over fifteen thousand years ago, we don't know the exact time. So the significance of Adi Yogi is this, for the first time for the human beings, he said, if you are willing to strive, you can cross all the limitations that nature has set up for you. Only thing is if you're willing to strive. And above all, the most important thing of this is, he's the first one. I, I don't want to take the credit away from the English people. Uh, <laughs> Charles Darwin spoke about evolution about hundred and fifty years ago. You had a two hundredth birth anniversary recently. So, uh, Adiyogi spoke of evolutionary process over fifteen thousand years ago. He spoke in a different language. When they asked how life happened, what is its beginning, what is its end, when his disciples asked him, he said the first form of life was fish. Second form of life, he said, is a turtle of amphibious life. That means life is moving out of water, finding its way on the land. You Indian people know about the nine avatars. Hmm? The next one is uh, an animal usually is called a wild boar because wild boar is supposed to be the most physical creature among the mammals. So he says it's a wild boar. Next one is half man, half animal. Next one is a dwarfed man. Next one is a full-fledged man but emotionally volatile man. Next one is a peaceful man. Next one is a loving man. Next one is a meditative man. The next one which is yet to come is supposed to be a mystical man. That could be you because because if you pull out a small thing in your hand and start speaking to somebody in India or America, you're quite mystical. If you only <laughs> Yes. I'm saying if only you had a phone hundred years ago, you could claim your God and people would have believed it. <laughs> yes or no? So, he is not talking about individual people, he is talking about different stages of evolution. If you look at what Adi Yogi spoke, in many ways it runs absolutely parallel to what Charles Darwin spoke hundred and fifty years ago. So he spoke about evolution and he said, till now evolution happened without your consent. Now you have the privilege to decide how far you want to evolve. This is the… he said, this is the most significant aspect of being human is this, that you decide your evolution. When you were a monkey, uh, it's not my statement, it's Charles Darwin, okay? <laughs> When you were a monkey, you did not decide, I want to become a human being. Nature just pushed you on for whatever reasons. But now that you're a human being, now you can decide what kind of a human being you want to be. This moment you can be like a brute, next moment you, you can be godlike. Both are possible for you right here. So he said the most significant dimension of being human is you determine your evolution. This is the only creature on the planet who has that freedom to do that. He said this is the most important thing and he gave one hundred and twelve methods through which a human being can evolve to their ultimate nature. So that's why Adi Yogi. Namaskaram Sadhguru. I would like to know about uh, science of consecration and if I'm worthy of knowing it, how do I go about it? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, we must uh, congratulate uh, Yelda because in the next three weeks uh, she will be a mother. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
this is terrible gender discrimination <laughs> because only women are ever allowed this privilege <laughs> <laughs> so, she was talking to me about how she is conscious when, when there is a situation in any place, given place, without any logic to it, conscious of certain energies and how different people and different forms and different spaces impact you. So the science of consecration is just this. The best material to consecrate is a human being. It… because of all the physical forms on this planet, this is the most evolved physical form. The easiest thing to consecrate is a human being. But the problem with the human being is, every few minutes they'll make a U-turn. You can consecrate them right now, by tomorrow morning we don't know. So first of all, to get them committed to stay with whatever is given to them is a big issue especially in today's world. Because of that, we consecrate other forms. We always want to choose a form or a substance, first of all, which is of the highest density possible because physical form, its strength and its integrity depends upon its density. So we normally solidify mercury to do this. This is called as rasavaidya, which means it is the technology of solidifying mercury. People think it's a miracle. No, it's not a miracle. We use mercury as a process of consecration. The idea is it will change the very energy in which you are. Well, today our modern science is still busy studying physical things. Everything physical about you has been gathered from outside, isn't it so? Hello? What you call as my body is just a piece of this planet you slowly get it by the food that you eat. So if everything physical about you is just something else, not you, what you gathered cannot be you. What is you? Definitely there is a dimension beyond physicality. If you ignore that, there's simply no life. But right now, still the logic, the human logic which thinks it is scientific is still at this level of logic that except what I can measure on the instrument does not exist. So actually all of you do not exist <laughs> because you cannot be measured. This happened to me, I don't subject myself to these indignities anymore. <laughs> Way back because of some obligation I had to… I was in some institute, they said we want to measure your gamma waves. I didn't know I had gamma waves <laughs> <laughs> They said, no, there are gamma waves in your brain, we will measure it. So they put fourteen electrodes into my body and they said, uh, meditate. I said, I don't know how to meditate. <laughs> they said, you teach everybody meditation. Yes, I do because they don't know how to sit still <laughs> If you want, I will sit still. But this is the whole problem. Their problem is they want what kind of meditation? They want a name and the process and they want to measure the result. So I am not going to give them that pleasure. I said, if you want, I'll sit still. So I simply sat. After about twenty minutes, with some metallic object, they're hitting that funny place in your elbow, you know, yeah. where it hurts most. <laughs> then I thought it's part of their experiment and I sat there. <laughs> then they're hitting my ankle, my knee. It became quite consistent and painful <laughs> Then I opened my eyes and said, am I doing something wrong? Why am I being beaten <laughs> They said, no, uh, according to our uh, instruments, you are dead <laughs> I said, uh, this is a great diagnosis you have <laughs> But then they thought through and they said, uh, no, it looks like your brain is dead. <laughs> I said, I will stay with the first opinion. <laughs> I am dead like this is okay with me. Brain dead if you give me a certificate. <laughs> That's not going to be good. Why I am saying this is, the essential life that you are, you think you are going to measure it in some instrument? Only physical processes will measure, isn't it? And you know, everything physical about you is from outside. It's not yours, hmm? It's not yours, it's just a piece of the planet. So, 
you can't be measured so you don't exist. What a great conclusion are you making? So what is consecration? Is a dimension of energy which is not physical in nature, but it's life, concentrated life, let's say. Consecration is a way of creating a very concentrated life process. If you walk in, it's like that. So, in certain cultures, particularly in India, every street we consecrated at one time. But people slowly misunderstood thinking these are temples for worship, whatever, it all went into all kinds of things. But still there are fantastic spaces of consecration in that culture, you must come and experience this. These days they are measuring some bio stuff and all, they are saying some fantastic things happening, I don't know what their meters are. But I know this, Yelda is saying she knows this, if you walk into a space, you know how alive or dead that space is. So is it measurable by something? No. Only life knows life. When life meets life, it knows. When life meets death, it knows. <laughs> is there some instrument to measure this? No. Because all your instruments can only measure physical processes. So consecration is the concentrated life process. No human being should live in unconsecrated spaces. If you care for humanity, especially children, especially children below fourteen years of age, believe me, if you make sure they spend a certain amount of time in consecrated spaces, you will not have any of this nonsense about adol adolescence problems. See, right now, Toddler, if you're an infant, diaper problems, toddler means he's running away problems, adolescent means some other problem, middle age means crisis, old age means horrible. <laughs> when are you going to live, I'm asking <laughs> You're looking at life process as a problem. It's not a problem. You're making it a problem because you're trying to fit life into your intellect. No, your intellect fits into this life perfectly well. If you try to fit this life into this intellect, it's not going to work. So consecration is a dimension and a science and a technology with which you concentrate life in such a way, if you walk in, you… whole energy system bursts forth. You will see we have created spaces like this. If people just walk in, sheer intensity, simply tears start flowing. They don't know why. Simply the intensity of the place, simply tears start coming. You must every day, your cheeks should be washed with tears of love, joy and ecstasy. If this doesn't happen, you're not living yet. Sadhguru, we've, we've just got a few more minutes uh, left, but I, I wondered, I mean, it was such a beautiful thought that you just left us with, but I wondered if there was some final thought or a mantra or something that you can leave our, our audience <laughs> <laughs> with before they go home. <laughs> See, uh, this is what I would like to change. To learn A, B, C, just twenty-six alphabets in English language. If you come to Tamil language, two hundred and twelve alphabets at least, it's complicated <laughs> Only twenty-six alphabets. Tell me, how many years did you spend just learning the alphabet and learning to use it? Your basic education till high school, this all you're doing, learning to use the language and using the language so that you can understand whatever comes your way, this all, at least twelve years. Twelve years you spent, one solar cycle that's called in yoga, one solar cycle you spent just to learn a language, to communicate with people. But to transform your life, you want a two-minute mantra <laughs> That is what she was trying to say because <laughs> certain people told you that if you just utter this so many syllables, everything will be transformed. I'm not saying it is not possible. It is possible because sound has that power to transform if you use the sound right. <coughs> but what level of preparation are you is the question. If you throw such a small seed somewhere, it will become a huge tree. But only if the soil is fertile, isn't it? If you have put it here on this platform, will it grow? So, what have we done to ourselves? What is the level of preparedness we have? This is the issue. All of you, I could just initiate you into a powerful meditation process, just like that, in two minutes. If only certain level of preparedness was there, 
But to do this, a few minutes of initiation, normally in our basic program we spend thirty to thirty-two hours of preparation because everybody is invested in all kinds of identities. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, what is the secret? How did you become like this? I told them, this is all I did. Never identified myself with anything. The moment your intelligence gets identified with something, you must understand this, the nature of the intellect is such, suppose you identify that you are a woman, now your intellect keeps on doing rounds around that, protecting this gender all the time. Now you say, I'm English. Now it will go only around that, protecting that. Now you say, I'm a particular religion. Now it will go only around that. Whatever is your identity, your intellect will serve only that. The moment you identify yourself with something, you have subjugated your intelligence to just self-defense and protection and survival. The intellect could have been a penetrating force to reveal life to you. Instead, you are using it to fight life, other life, because it's a defense mechanism. The moment I have an identity, I have to defend it, isn't it? Just to be here without any sense of who the hell I am, you actually don't know who the hell you are. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Assumed stuff, isn't it? Only because you dip into your memory. So if suppose Mr. Alzheimer visits you, <laughs> suddenly you don't know who the hell you are? <laughs> Even now you don't know. This is an assumption based on the accumulated memory. So if you just learn this one thing before you go to bed tonight, Everything that you are not, keep it aside and go to bed, okay? Say right now this clothing, is this you? No. So you understand this, not me. It's not that physically you have to keep it aside. <laughs> I'm saying, <laughs> you know this is not me. Is this me? This is not me. Is this body me? This is accumulated, this can't be me, isn't it? It is said, if you live here for about seventy-five years, you approximately eat, depending upon your diet of course, you approximately eat between twelve to fourteen hundred tons of food. Are you carrying it right now? <laughs> Hello? Those of you who are middle aged, are you carrying at least six hundred tons? <laughs> Where is it? What you thought was my body is coming and going all the time, isn't it? It's not even the same body. It's coming and going all the time. So this is not me, if you keep it aside. All the impressions that you have gathered, you also gathered from outside. Keep that aside. Everything that's not you, just keep it aside and go to bed and see if you can just be little conscious till that last moment till you fall asleep. Most people don't know when they fall asleep. Most people. When I say most, I'm being generous with percentages, ninety-nine <laughs> If you make a little effort, just a little effort, a few days, if you make an effort to stay conscious till you fall asleep, you will see you will wake up like a newborn baby every day. And it's important. Why… why I'm saying a newborn baby where Yelda will have this experience in a wonderful way, you will see the baby… <laughs> what, is, what do you think he's trying to do? He's drinking life. You become life. <laughs> Why? Because you're… you're just living in the capsule of your memory, you think you already got it. If you got it, you must be dead, isn't it? So people are practicing death in installments. <laughs> See, if you're really super alive, it's fantastic. If you're dead, it's good. But if I want to torture you, what will I do? I will not kill you. I will make you half alive. That's torture, isn't it? This is what is self-inflicted for most human beings right now. They are keeping themselves half alive and they're wondering why life is such a torture. I just asked a simple question about a year, a year and a half ago when I was in London. I was speaking to a very prominent group of people. I asked, how many people in London city can sit in the evening peacefully even without a glass of wine. They clearly said less than one percent <laughs> So to be healthful, you need a chemical. Today seventy percent of the people are on prescription medication of some sort. 
To be peaceful, you need chemicals. To be joyful, you need chemicals. To be ecstatic, of course you have ecstasy <laughs> I'm saying for everything if you need chemicals from outside, this is not a moral issue for me. The concern is this, if ninety percent of the population is doing chemicals to be healthful, joyful, peaceful, everything, the next generation that you produce will be less than you. This is a crime against humanity. Next generation should be at least one step ahead of us. But if you produce a generation which is behind you, you're seeing this. You're beginning to see this everywhere. If you produce a generation which is less than you, you have committed a serious crime against humanity. This will happen in a big way if we don't go off chemicals, both prescribed and otherwise. If you are extremely joyful within yourself, you found the amrita within yourself. You are extremely… you are an extreme state of pleasantness. Now, being with people, not anymore about squeezing pleasure out of them. Being with people is just out of… just being with them. Only now you are truly capable of love, otherwise it is just a open sesame trick. I love you means whether they believe you or not, for that moment they make themselves believe you because they are also in need of something, you are also in need of something. Isn't it? It's a… it's like the… you know, Alibaba under forty? <laughs> open sesame means it opens. This is just like the I love you means many things open up. Now, by doing this, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, that's the way people conduct their life, there's nothing to it. But by doing this, the true possibility of knowing an intense sense of love within you is lost. You're here constantly looking, what can I get out of this person, what can I get out of that person? This is a con job. It's called a love affair <laughs> but it's a con job. But if you are extremely ecstatic by yourself when you're being with people, it's about sharing your ecstasy. It is about if they are not touched by it, somehow to touch them with it, rather than seeing what you can squeeze out of them. The whole fundamentals of your life will change. Yes and no in the sense, it is not the sexuality which limits it, but it's the excessive identity with the physicality which limits it. So, it is not sexuality per se which becomes the barrier, but the attachment it creates to the physicality which definitely becomes the barrier. This question is coming from a certain amount of bits and pieces, the gossip that you have heard about how you could assimilate your own semen and raise it up to your higher possibility, yes, it is true. At the same time, it is not because of abstinence that one does it, it is because of internalizing your energies that you do it. It is not simply that somebody is abstaining from sex and suddenly his energies are all organized and it's going up, it's not true. If your energies get organized and begin to move up, the need for sexuality may evaporate for you, but it doesn't leave you incapable. It doesn't leave you impotent, but the need is gone. It is just no more a compulsive thing. And it is not just this one thing, all compulsiveness is lost. Essentially, most of the sexuality that's happening on the planet is happening because of a certain compulsiveness, isn't it? It's a compulsive drive. When you become conscious, when all compulsiveness disappears, this also disappears. 
It is just that because people are so body-oriented, they're always thinking spirituality versus sexuality. They're not connected. They're not connected. One is of the body, another is of a different dimension. It is simply because people are so… because religions of the world, moral schools and the ethical schools have been always speaking against it, it has become such a big issue in people's minds. They think the only way to know something beyond is, you must be away from this. Because somewhere you're not able to accept the simple biology of a human being which is the tragedy that you cannot accept the simple biology. You either have to celebrate it or you have to push it down the drain. Both are not needed. You can look at it for the limitation that it is and for the possibility that it is. So, if because of the impurity of sex, your spirituality is going to get disturbed, I want you to know that your very birth is impure. When you come from such an impure birth, where is the possibility for you? <laughs> there is no possibility for you. Only if you fell from somewhere else, if the stoke dropped you, <laughs> there is some possibility of you becoming spiritual. If, you are, if your mother had a normal birth, you have no possibility. A six-year-old girl came home one day from school and asked, Mama, how was I born? The mother was embarrassed. She said, a stoke dropped you. She said, okay. She noted down, Mama, how are you born? A stoke dropped me too. Mama, how is grandmama born? A stoke dropped her too. Then the girl became serious and she went down and th sat down and started writing. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers, and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness, and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly, or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision and vision means is, say everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you're saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. <laughs> I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer organization, to be a volunteer, a volunteer means Somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. 
So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer, I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, thank you <laughs> Because I have sp spoken to conscripted people also, I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly. You're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I am doing something willingly, makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. The difference between heaven and hell is just this, you are doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You are doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two mm -hmm. communities, two nations, two many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even on national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet, it's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society. No, there are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. If you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. There are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. Mm, that's big. That's big. <laughs> the, the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. Mm -hmm. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I am like this because I have not given that freedom to anybody that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy. These privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too because if somebody else can decide what can happen within you right now, isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide. What should happen within you? What happens around you, of course, sim so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers, they're unwilling. Volunteering means you have no will of your own, you can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization, this means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> yes. 
most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing <laughs> and I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> so people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she is so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. <laughs> and today, <laughs> but if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes. yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. Yeah, all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance <laughs> to life. What means folks to you and what way can we apply focus in our daily life? So, what's your definition of focus? Okay. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference. There is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist. All that's happened is there is no attention because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 